Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here on January 14th, Monday, for the full council meeting. The January 14th city council meeting will come to order. I'm Bruce Harrell, president of the council. Will the clerk please call the roll? Bagshaw? Here. Herbold? Here. Johnson? Here. Juarez? Mosqueda? Here. O'Brien? Here. Sawant? Here. President Harrell? Here. Seven present. Very good. If there's no objection, today's introduction and referral calendar will be adopted. Hearing no objection, the introduction and referral calendar is adopted. And if there's no objection, today's agenda will be adopted. Hearing no objection, today's agenda is adopted. The minutes of the December 10th, 2018 meeting have been reviewed. And if there's no objection, the minutes, minutes will be signed. Minutes are signed. Presentations. I think we have a, uh, a great presentation today by Councilmember Mosqueda, and I'll turn the floor over to Councilmember Council Member Mosqueda. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Today I'm honored to be introducing a labor history proclamation on behalf of the city of Seattle. Thanks to centuries of struggle and work by workers, their labor unions, advocacy groups, and elected officials like my colleagues here, Seattle and Washington State has been recognized as being on the forefront of labor protections. We know about recent labor advances like Seattle's paid sick and safe leave, like the fight for $15 an hour minimum wage, fighting to ban the box so that more workers can have access to economic security, secure schedules so that people aren't at the whims of changing schedules and clopenings, and the work that we did this last year on the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, being the first city in the nation to pass labor standard protections for domestic workers who care for our kiddos, our elders, and our homes. These are just some of the accomplishments we've accomplished here in Seattle over the last Last decade. But our city and our state has had labor history wins over the last century. And this year, we celebrate the many milestones, including the 100 year anniversary of the Seattle general strike. This year, we face ongoing attacks from the national level. And here at the local level, we're standing up to educate our community about labor's past history and current struggles. We're standing up to make sure that folks know that at the local level, we're here to lift up workers, unions, and to fight for more equitable conditions for all. These are the protections that we've been working on throughout Seattle's history, and we're looking forward to continuing to learn from those going forward. We're proud of our history, we're proud of our recent accomplishments, and this proclamation today um, concretizes our uh, commitment to continuing work, to work together and learn from our history. Mr. President, if I may, I'd like to read a couple of the um, passages from this proclamation. Excellent. Please do. <laughs> Whereas Seattle's organized labor unions and the broader labor movement have been vital to the progress of American democracy, helping to secure not only higher standards of living, but greater access to democracy and giving workers the ability to counter the power of money with the power of many, both in the workplace and in the halls of government. Whereas labor unions promote health and well-being by ensuring higher wages, retirement benefits, limits on working hours, opportunities for job training, safer environments, and discrimination-free workplaces, and the benefits also extend beyond union members by unions negotiating health insurance for families, paid vacations, and holidays for all workers, according to the University of Washington. Unions have helped create healthier work workers, workplaces, and communities, according to the U.S. National Library of Medi Medicine National Institutes of Health. Whereas on the 100-year anniversary of the Seattle General Strike, 2019 presents an opportunity to acknowledge several important anniversaries in Seattle and in Washington State, including the Spokane free speech fight of 1909, the Centralia tragedy of 1919, the 20th anniversary of the battle in Seattle during the WTO demonstrations, whereas the Seattle general strike of 1919 was a five-day general work stoppage by more than 65,000 workers lasting from February 6th to February 11th of that year in support support of workers striking to protect their right for fair wages and to bargain collectively and directly with their employers. And whereas a coalition of labor unions, museums, archives, labor heritage organizations are all working together to organize a series of events throughout this year, 2019, to recognize and educate the public about the significance and legacy of these important events. So this proclamation, Mr. President, asks for us to recognize the year 2019 as the year commemorating the labor movement and the history 
history of working people in Seattle. Um, I'm excited about this proclamation. I thank all of the council for their support. I want to just quickly say thank you to Case, uh, Connor Casey from the Labor Archives of Washington, Harry Bridges Center of Labor Studies, Pacific Northwest Labor History Association, Martin Luther King County Labor Council, Pierce County Labor Council, Washington State Labor Council, AFL-CIO, MOHI, History Link, ILWU, Local 23, Young Workers Committee, Tacoma Historical Society, David Jepson, Thurston, Lewis Mason County Central Labor Council, and many others um, who are pulling together events in this year in our region to celebrate labor history. And thanks finally to Sejal Parikh, my Chief of Staff, who has been working diligently with these community members to bring this proclamation forward. I would love, Mr. President, if I might be able to present this to Mr. Casey um, on the city's behalf. If there's no objections, we'll suspend the rules. Uh, no objection, the rules are suspended. Allow uh, Councilmember Mosqueda to proceed. And um, thank you, Sejal, too, on behalf of the full council. Yes. Let's <laughs> try not to put a bomb. Uh, not intentional. Sure. Hi, um, on behalf of the Pacific Northwest Labor History Association, the Labor Archives of Washington, and the Solidarity Centennial Committee, I want to thank the Seattle City Council and Council Member Mosqueda, um, our Chief of Staff, Sejal Parikh, for inviting us to be here today and for this proclamation declaring this a year of labor history and education. I also want to acknowledge Council Member Herbold, who have supported the Labor Archives, and Council Member Sawant, who has collaborated with us in the past. I know they have all been supporters of labor culture and history in their own rights. I want you to picture it. High rent, uncertain living wages, transit systems straining at the influx of new workers attracted to jobs in a dominant industry, and rampant income inequality. Is this Seattle of 2019? This was 1919, when a shipyard strike grew to become a regional labor shutdown, led by militant unionists, unsanctioned by their parent unions and national federation that closed Seattle for the better part of a week. From February 6th to 11th, 1919, more than 65,000 workers represented by the 10, 110 unions affiliated with the Seattle Central Labor Council, representing about 20% of Seattle's population, went out on strike. Importantly, the strike was supported in solidarity by large numbers of non-union members and non-wage workers as well. Women, children, and relatives of families with union members supported the strikers. Japanese American labor organizations, though excluded from membership in the largely white US labor movement at the time, chose to honor and participate in the strike alongside their fellow unionists. The strike had its origins in the shipyards. During World War I, the government imposed wage freezes in war industries. At war's end, shipyard unions demanded a raise and resumed of resuming of collective bargaining directly with their employers. Negotiations were complicated by a federal board, which discouraged Seattle employers from meeting the union's demands. When the workers struck, uh, when their uh, employers continually refused to meet their conditions. The strike lives in popular men memory as a testament to the power of solidarity and direct action by working people. Though the scale of the strike panicked local and state officials and the Seattle Chamber of Commerce, who mobilized police and military personnel despite the stri strike's nonviolent character, the strike was administered peacefully and competently by the workers themselves. A central strike committee administered the strike, making sure hospitals had sheets and babies had milk, and through a network of kitchens, the people of Seattle were fed. Diverse groups united across occupations, racial, ethnic, and gender divisions, and political affiliations to assert themselves in a powerful eruption of collective action. The strike was administered peacefully and competently by the workers themselves, as I mentioned. This became a powerful model and source of inspiration for the labor movement in Seattle, the United States, and beyond. Later general strikes in San Francisco and Minneapolis, St. Paul in 1934 and Oakland in 1946 looked to the general strike in Seattle as a historic example, drawing from the lessons learned and the example it provided. I'm part of a statewide series of events, a planning committee um, called Solidarity Centennial, which is, as Council Member Mosqueda mentioned, a coalition of labor, history, educational, cultural heritage, and social justice groups across the Pacific Northwest. And we've been meeting for more than a year to try to plan a whole statewide series of events throughout 2019 
to commemorate the centennial of the 1919 Seattle general strike and the Centralia tragedy as well as other events. Um, we are having events, exhibits, commemorations open to all and our website is solidaritycentennial.com. We have three events in an exhibit at Mohai in February, on February 2nd, 6th, and 7th. They will include a new documentary on Pacific Northwest labor history, a documentary on radical feminist journalist and general strike committee member Anna Louise Strong, and a theatrical and musical event employing voices from the strike performed by the Seattle Labor Course. There will be an exhibit at UW Special Collections Labor Archives launching February 4th, the Labor Archives annual event, as well as a, the Pacific Northwest Labor History Association annual history bus tour, on February 9th, and there will be a walking tour of radical Asian American labor put on by the Wing Luke Museum and several other related events. There'll be book readings by professor of history of UW, Jim Gregory, um, and the UW Press who have republished the central academic history of the strike. And a new book on the strike is coming out this year. And Centralia in November, there'll be commemorations of the Centralia tragedy of 1919. And we're also talking to the Fair Work Center about a potential event. I wanna invite everyone to participate and attend all these events and to thank you all very much for supporting and acknowledging our efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katherine Mosqueda. President. Okay, at this time we'll take public comment on items that appear on today's agenda or our introduction and referral calendar or our work program. And um, just by way of context, this is the general sign up and then later on in the agenda we have a I, an issue on the ballot that will come up and we'll have a separate public uh, hearing on that and I'll call that out when we get to that agenda item. So this is just for the general agenda and we'll start off with Mr. Alex Zimmerman followed by Ruth Danner. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Hi, my name is Alex Zimmerman. Yeah, I want to speak about Number one in agenda about zoning. I live in the city for more than 30 years, but what has happened for the last five years when Amazon come together with you in destroy city, I don't see the sense. Everything what is you doing right now is to look to me like pure masturbation. You don't change nothing. Everything what is you doing right now, this makes situation worse, worse, and worse. Five years ago, nobody from you stopped in Amazon. Four years ago, nobody from you stopped in Amazon. Three years ago, nobody stopped from you Amazon. Two years ago, and now, nobody stopped in Amazon. We want to fix it as zoning problem. This cannot be fixed it or zoning problem. Most Seattle will comfortable life for many years, and I live in Seattle more than 30 years. I know about this. So what is you doing right now? You make situation more worse, worse, and worse. We can fix this it's very easy. And right now, Amazon in New York show how people in New York don't like Amazon. But you never talking about move Amazon out from downtown or ever cut them by, by 10,000 people. When you talk to Amazon and cut Amazon a little bit, every problem will be fixed automatically. We come back to normal life. Not maybe like before, but much better. But you never talking about this. Why? Because you all are fascist. Seattle's right now with number one fascist city in America. When you, government, council, together with corporation like Amazon in another corporation, make life miserable for the people. It don't have sense, we're talking about labor, we're talking about union, a BS, forgive me my, my expression, you know what it means. A real union fighting for the people, a real council fighting for the people. Stand up, America. The Heil, my lovely Führer. Okay, so our next speaker will be Ruth and then uh, followed by Megan Cruz. Thank you, Mr. President and members of the City Council. I'm here to speak today about CB 119398, which I understand you'll be voting on to, or discussing today. My primary concern as a resident of downtown is the removal of the Director's Rule 5 2009. Uh, that rule uh, requires new construction to consider levels of service for intersections downtown. And uh, when it is removed and replaced with a re an effort to reduce single occupancy vehicles, but downtown is exempted because it's too close to the 
because it's within the half mile limit for the link. Downtown, we will have no more mitigation. You'll be adding more parking spaces to the parking garages, but not counting the cars that will fill them. Thank you very much for your time, and I'll see the rest of my time to my fellow. Thank you. Uh, Megan Cruz, then followed by Connor. Well, I don't know if Connor's going to speak again, but I am signed up. Go ahead. Great. Thank you. I'm here today also to ask the council, please reconsider voting yes on uh, the level of service standard bill before you. Uh, it was written with residential neighborhoods in mind, but in the city center, it will compound gridlock. It changes how traffic is accounted for downtown two ways. First, it eliminates Director's Rule 2009-5 that requires new towers show the traffic they generate won't overwhelm capacity on surrounding streets. Virtually all of the new towers exceed that capacity. Secondly, um, Currently, the current director's rule provides these towers can't be approved without offering mitigations to reduce their impacts. That code-based leverage and protection disappears with this bill. Secondly, the bill leaves out the biggest threat to downtown traffic by narrowly defining level of service as the percentage of single occupancy vehicles on the road. Downtown single occupancy vehicles only account for 23% of the traffic. That's the lowest percentage in the city. By looking at just one source of traffic, the bill omits downtown's biggest problem, the rapid growth of congestion from truck deliveries and ride hailing services. These aren't hypothetical concerns. We've talked about a small sliver of downtown development off Virginia Street that will add 6,500 new residents and over 10,000 daily vehicle trips. Because of this bill, there will be no grounds to require the transportation impacts from these developments be mitigated. In short, this bill is incomplete. It won't accurately measure or address adverse impacts on city center traffic. If the council really believes a level of service bill is not the place to address downtown transportation that's in crisis, then what is? Thank you. Thank you. I had Connor sitting here, but I think that might have been just a miscommunication on the sign-up sheet. Connor Casey, so I'll move on to uh, George Danner. Uh, thank you for your service and your time. Uh, my name is George Danner. I reside downtown at Second and Pike, and I'm speaking today uh, on council bill that ends with 398. Uh, I'd like you to uh, vote no, and here's my reasoning. I'm a retired Marine Chief Engineer with 35 years of experience, and a ship is just like a city, but it floats. And in my career, uh, in our fleet, there were people in the office that would decide what they were going to do, our, do to our ship. And it took a few years, but I learned that um, there was a really important question when they came to you with these proposals, and it was, does it make sense? And this bill doesn't make sense for downtown. Uh, it's incomplete. Uh, I'm afraid it will grant developers in Seattle another loophole that future residents, visitors, commercial and private drivers, pedestrians, fire, emergency police, transportation, and the land use planners will struggle with it and pay for its unanticipated negative effects on the life of the livability of the city today and into the future. Uh, and what happens if this gets passed and it doesn't work. What is plan B? And I was wondering if there is one, and hopefully there is. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Our last speaker I have signed up is the Honorable Michael Fuller. Yes, I thank my God for being here today, Bruce Harrell. But uh, I'm here because of the violations of the Chapter 42.30 Open Meeting Act. And I'm moving to amend uh, to case number 18-2-14942-8. The next court date is June 10th. So, uh, Margaret Lloyd Richards 
is stating she's being violated. Margaret Lord Richard Sue I. Jewel further alleged bad New Year 2019 for Black Lives Matter community. The Older American Act, October 3rd, 1965, that was signed by President Lyndon Johnson. Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, Voters' Rights Act, 1965. Dr. Martin Luther King speak, August 16th, 1967. Where did we go from here? European settlers, Neanderthal, September 11, 2001, by agent President Bruce A. Harrell is the most racist agent in United States history against George H.W. Bush Sr., who in fact served in the United States Navy during World War II, June 6th of 1944. George A.W. Bush also was the 40, 41st president of the United States also made law the America with Disability Act, July 26, 1990, and Section 5 of the Hoard Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which has not been enforced by city council members. Communist Control Act, August 24, 1954, that was signed by President Dwight Eisenhower, and the Organized Crime Control Act, October 15, 1970 that was signed by President Richard Nixon. Thank you, sir. President the, Bruce Harrell. Uh, uh, the Honorable, the you, time's uh, running Sir, I, you need to let Margaret Lord Richard back in here because you're violating her First Amendment oh, rights, due okay. process, equal protection of her 14th Amendment rights, and procedure due process, and substantive due process. Too much at me, brother. Too much. You're throwing too much at me. Okay, thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. You know I'm it. serious about I know this, you're Bruce serious, Harrell. too. I'm right there with you. I understand that. Thank you I got very more much. laws for you. I'm sure you do. Thank you, sir. State okay. and federal. Thank you, sir. Okay, that will conclude the public comment at this se section, and we'll move to the payment of the bills. Please Cam read the title. Councilable 119440, appropriate money to pay settlement and claims in order in the payment thereof. I'm not. I'll move to pass Council Bill 119440. It's been moved and seconded that the bill pass. Are there any comments? Please call the roll on the passage of the bill. Bagshaw? Aye. Herbold? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Juarez? Mosqueda? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Sawant? Aye. President Harrell? Aye. Eight in favor, none opposed. The bill passed in the Sheriff's Senate. Please read the first agenda item. The report of the Planning, Land Use, and Zoning Committee, Agenda Item 1, Council Bill 119398, relating to Land Use and Zoning, amending the title of Chapter 23.52, Subchapter 1 of the Seattle Municipal Code, and amending Sections 23.52.004 and .008 of the SMC, and repealing Section 23.52.002 of the SMC to implement the Comprehensive Plan Adopted Level of Service Standard. The committee recommends the bill pass as amended. Thank you very much. Council Member Johnson. Thanks. Um, we, in 2016, adopted an update to our comprehensive plan, and within that, um, we adopted a level of service standard that uh, relies on uh, what it, the industry would call a multimodal level of service. Um, it sets a series of targets for uh, reducing the number of folks that are driving alone, living in our neighborhoods throughout the city, and sets some goals for those targets. Um, the action that we uh, contemplate today would implement those level of service standards in neighborhoods throughout the city and do it in a way that would require residential uses with more than 30, uni 30 dwelling units, non-residential uses with greater than 4,000 square feet of gross floor area, or non-residential uses in industrial zones that have more than, more than 30,000 square feet of gross floor area, to start to propose ideas for folks uh, to be able to get to and around those uses without needing to have a car. Um, those uh, kinds of ideas will take effect uh, in an associated joint director's rule, but in could include things like of subsidizing transit passes, providing sidewalk improvements, or limiting the amount of parking that's provided on site. Um, it also r specifies thresholds that some projects are required uh, to go through impact studies related to transportation that are um, more projects will be going through this than currently are required to do so under the State Environmental Policy Act. So um, a complicated uh, technical piece of legislation, but one with an underarching objective of trying to ask developers to pay more to the city to allow for folks that are living or working in their units to be able to get around without needing to have a car. Very good. I'd ask for your support. Any questions or comments? Councilmember Herbold. 
Thank you. I just want to speak to some of the concerns that we heard during public comment today. Um, we also heard similar concerns during the uh, committee process in Councilmember Johnson's PLUS committee. Um, and what we learned um, through that process is that um, mitigation of transportation impact uh, impacts for downtown development um, as a matter of policy um, is limited pr currently to programmatic measures. So there is um, SEPA review for downtown projects and, and um, the, the one that is the, the, the mitigation that is most often used um, are transportation management plans. Um, in addition, um, development regulations in themselves create disincentives for single occupancy vehicle use downtown. Um, specifically, there are parking maximums for commercial development. Um, there are floor area ratio disincentives for the provision of above grade parking. Um, and there is um, a development standard where the, um, uh, there's a limit of floors above uh, grade parking um, and there is also a limit on the um, on, on requirements regarding screening. Thank you, Councilmember Herbold. Any further comments? Okay. And I want to thank um, those that came out to testify um, on the plan, at least for expressing concerns and having a record clear on your concerns. And hopefully, this will still work um, to, to your benefit, even though it may not be exactly the kind of legislation you wanted. So, thank you for coming out. Please call the roll on the passage of the bill. Bagshaw? Aye. Herbold? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Juarez? Aye. Mosqueda? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Sawant? Aye. President Harrell? Aye. Eight in favor, none opposed. Bill passed and chair was sign it. Please read the report of the Civil Rights, Utilities, Economic Development, and Arch Committee. Read uh, items two and three. The report of the Civil Rights, Utilities, Economic Development, and Arts Committee, agenda items two and three, appointments 1230 and 1231, reappointments of Prima Frank and Quentin I. Morris as members of Seattle Arts Commission. For term to December 31st, 2020, the committee recommends the appointments be confirmed. Councilmember Herbold. Thank you so much. Um, so the first appointment, uh, it's appointment uh, 1230, um, is Priya Frank. She is a uh, council reappointment. She acts as the Associate Director of Community Programs at the Seattle Art Museum currently. She previously worked at Lucid Lounge and the University of Washington, as well as the University, uh, I'm sorry, uh, University of Washington and ba Bothell, specifically their Office of Minority Affairs and Diversity. She is also a board member um, of on the boards and Tazvir. Um, in addition, um, Quentin Morris is also a reappointment to the Seattle Arts Commission, uh, still also a council reappointment. Uh, Mr. Morris is an internationally acclaimed violinist. He has won many, many awards. He's the director um, of chamber and instrumental music at Seattle University, as well as um, an associate professor um, of performing arts and arts leadership, and um, has an associate appointment to the Global African Studies. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Those in favor of confirming the appointments, please vote aye. 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 Those opposed, vote no. The motion carries and appointments are confirmed. P please read agenda item number four. Agenda item four, appointment 1232, appointment of Eric Graves, member of Seattle Human Rights Commission for a term to January 22nd, 2020. The committee recommends the appointment be confirmed. Council Member Herbold. Thank you. Um, Eric is a uh, appointment that has been brought forward to us by the Human Rights Commission itself. Uh, Eric is a survivor and a community advocate for victims of sex trade um, and trafficking. They pro previously worked as a case manager for homeless youth, and further they have been serving um, unappointed, but serving dutifully as uh, a commissioner to the Seattle Human Rights Commission for a few months now. Very good. Any comments? Those in favor of confirming the appointment, please vote aye. 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 Those opposed vote no. The motion carries the appointment is confirmed. Please read the report of the Finance and Neighborhoods Committee. The report of the Finance and Neighborhoods Committee, agenda item five, appointment 1233, appointment of J.J. McKay as member of Pike Place Market Preservation and Development Authority Governing Council for term to June 30th, 2022. The committee recommends the appointment be confirmed. Councilmember Beckshaw. Thank you very much. Um, many of you know J.J. McKay. He's been a fixture in the city and a number of boards, including Mary's Place, uh, U.S. Bank, uh, Seattle Opera, 
and I first got to know him about 10 years ago, and he's currently being uh, nominated for appointment to the Pike Place Market PDA Governing Council. He has um, a track record as an experienced executive and leader in both for and nonprofit sectors. And I will tell you that the uh, CEO of Pike Place Market was here with us and was very enthusiastic about getting his expertise on the board. We recommend his appointment. Very good. Any comments? Those in favor of confirming the appointment, please vote aye. 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 Those opposed vote no. The motion carries. The appointment is confirmed. Please read agenda item number six. Agenda item six, appointment 1234, appointment of Glenn M. Lee as member of Benaroya Hall Music Center Board for term two. Excuse me. The committee recommends the appointment be confirmed. Right. Mr. Beckshaw. Good. So this is the appointment of Glenn Lee. And he is known to most of us as our uh, director of our of finance here within the city, but he is now being appointed to uh, the, I've just lost this, um, the Benaroya Music Center Board of Directors. Thank you very much. And he, I asked him whether he was a uh, major music enthusiast, and he said, of course, but he is being brought in on this because of his stewardship for the city finances, and we recognize and welcome his appointment to Benaroya Music Center Board. Very good. Any comments? Those in favor of confirming the appointment, please vote aye. 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 Those opposed vote no. The motion carries. The appointment is confirmed. Please read agenda item number seven. Agenda item seven, appointment 1236, reappointment of Mary McCumber as member of Historic Seattle Preservation Development Authority Governing Council for a term to November 30th, 2022. The committee recommends the appointment be confirmed. Thank you. So this reappointment of Mary McCumber brings her, brings her to us after she's already served 18 years on Historic Seattle Council, including four years as chair. This will actually be her sixth term. Mary, again, many of us know her for her work on FutureWise, and she was the director of the City of Auburn's Department of Planning and Community Development. We're delighted that she's willing to continue on this particular board, and we recommend that her confirmation be approved today. Very good. Any comments? Those in favor of confirming the appointment, please vote aye. 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 Those opposed vote no. The motion carries and the appointment is confirmed. Okay, uh, adoption of other, other resolutions. Please read it into the record. Agenda item eight, resolution 31860, supporting the Seattle Public Schools Proposition 1 and Proposition 2, and urging Seattle voters to vote yes on Proposition 1 and Proposition 2 on the February 12th, 2019 special election ballot. Okay, as provided for under RCW 42.7. 15A.555. The City Council will now consider the adoption of Resolution 31860 that was read into the record. And at the conclusion of Council Member comments, the Council will hear comments from members of the public who wish to speak on the resolution. Uh, this resolution, of course, endorses Seattle School, Seattle School District's Propositions 1 and 2, which relate to operation and building infrastructure funding on the February 12, 2019 special election ballot. So an approximate equal opportunities to, uh, to speak will be given to members of the public. Um, thanks for reading the uh, item into the record, and I'll uh, relinquish the floor to Councilmember Johnson. Thanks. Uh, I bring this forward on behalf of um, not only my colleague, Councilmember Gonzalez, but also all those of us who are parents of kids in public schools. Um, the two levies in front of uh, voters this February present a unique opportunity for us to continue our decades-long partnership between the City of Seattle and the school district and its board of directors on complementary investments. And uh, the investments that are in front of voters uh, this February are critical ones. Not only do we have a very, very long list of capital investments um, that would transform and reconstruct several schools throughout the city, but also will make investments in nearly, if not every single school in the uh, city of Seattle. But in addition, uh, the operating levy, commonly referred to as the BTA levy, um, also has a set of critical operational investments that are necessary for all of our students to excel in all of our Seattle public schools. So this ongoing partnership between the city and the school district, I think is a critical one, and I'm 
super excited to see this ambitious plan on the ballot and looking forward to voting yes myself. Very good. Council Member Bagshaw. Thank you so much, Mr. Johnson, for your leadership on this. And I'm wondering if you could just hold up that map and the back side of it. I don't know if whether people can. I'll give it to you. Sir. Thank you. So what I appreciated about this map, and I'm not sure that we can even begin to have it uh, focused from the Seattle Channel, but this is the number of schools that will be aided by this particular levy. And the back side of it identifies, I mean, almost to the dollar, what kinds of things will be done at each elementary, middle school, and high school. So I am I know that there's been some controversy around this. People are saying, well, how come that the McCleary decision didn't take care of it? Well, the McCle McCleary didn't McCleary decision didn't take care of it. And so for us to continue to have the grade A quality public school system that we want, we need to support this levy. Um, and I'm happy to be doing that. So thank you for bringing this forward. Thank you. Councilmember Herbold. Thank you. And I did just want to speak to um, some of the controversy that Councilmember Bagshaw alluded to. Um, there was um, a Seattle Times editorial last week um, that I made some, some inquiries about. Um, they uh, had two, two contentions, one related to the size of the operations levy and the second related to uh, concern that it would be, um, the levy would be undermining sort of the basic tenant of McCleary, which is to make sure that there is um, uh, there, there isn't unequal funding um, in school districts across the state where um, uh, cities with school districts um, and taxpayers who are willing and able to fund um, basic education um, are able to do so more plentifully than other school districts. And what I um, learned uh, from my inquiry is that it, it is true that the um, size of the operations levy, the request um, in the levy itself um, is a different number than what they can currently be legally collected. Um, it is in excess of the uh, legally authorized collection amount. but. Um, that doesn't mean that they're going to be able to collect all that money. The plan is, um, again, and I think this is very consistent with the intent of McCleary, the, the plan is to go back to the state legislature this year to increase the amount that can legally be collected um, under state law, thus maintaining that strong commitment that we have to make sure that different um, school districts across the state are not put in different positions depending on whether or not um, those particular districts are able to, to pass levies. So in, in, in essence, increasing the, um, the collection amount gives um, the Seattle Public Schools some, some uh, flexibility because by asking for the additional capacity now, they don't have to go back um, if the state law is itself uh, changed. And then the other point that I think is um, important to note, that there was a question about the use of the dollars and, and again, whether or not the use of the dollars is consistent um, with the legislative decisions made um, in the legislature last year. Um, and I think it's uh, important to take note that the um, state office of the superintendent of public uh, instruction approved the Seattle um, Public Schools plan for the operations levy um, and took the position that it is in fact consistent with state law. Thank you. Good. Thanks for those comments, Councilman Herbold. Any further comments? If not, we're going to move to public hearing. Any further comments? Okay, so as required by law, we have two sign up sheets for Proposition 1 and Proposition 2. So I'm going to uh, call you out in the order that you sign it, signed up, and we'll start off. Just one moment here. Give me one sec. Okay, so we'll start off with Mr. Alex Zimmerman, and following Mr. Zimmerman will be Melissa uh, Palethorpe. It's on Proposition Number One. I have two sign-up sheets, though. Should, should I go through first and second? It's a little bit confusing. I'm sorry, Mr. Zimmerman. I 
humbly apologize for interrupting. Can you start his time back, please? Um, it may. I have two sign-up sheets, but the same people sign up for both. And so, yes. um, why don't we just speak on both of them? No problem. Um, one and two. two. So you absolutely. Can, you You're absolutely okay. right. Proposition one and proposition two. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. I, I'm very happy when I see something common sense, but it was very unusual in this chamber. So, situation right now, very simple, yes. It's exactly what is I want to explain to you. Money need for school. It's exactly, absolutely. I'm not too much sure how much money. Because money, what is we have here, we're talking about billions. My experience with the board of school director, but as I come and see who these people, it's very low, primitive, not professional. We cannot give these people chance to operate with billion dollars. We need somebody who has different opinion. They have the same opinion like you. He belongs in the same principle like you use. More money, more money in stealing money. That's exactly what's happened. We're talking about billion and billion dollars. And I'm absolutely sure, like professional business consultant, because I don't care to speak this for a couple of minutes, we have more than enough money now in the system. We can fix it everything 10 times cheaper, five times cheaper, maybe three times, but much cheaper. So this happened and happened again and again. But what is I want to talk to right now about this? It's about operation with money and business principle. What is every business have, government or not government? 700,000 idiots who live in this city deserve their government. They want to pay billion and billion dollars. I'm very happy with this. Because when 700,000 idiots pay a billion and billion dollars, or billion and billion dollars, a billion and billion dollars for transportation, for school, for everything, and nothing go better. So I'm very happy when the 700,000 natural born degenerate idiot will be wake up and clean chamber like you, totally in school board like two, totally. Because what is you look right now is a pure fascism. When government, together with corporation, suck blood and money from us. Stop fascism, clean this chamber, stand up, America. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, at least we're all in line with the public now. So Melissa will be followed by Jake Ewert. Hi, my name is Melissa Palethorpe. I'm the president of Schools First, the organization that mobilizes the Get Out the Vote campaign for the school levies. And here as a volunteer and a parent in our public schools. Um, thank you all for supporting this resolution. Uh, I think Council Member Bagshaw pointed out that uh, the capital levy has uh, significant funding and improvements for the buildings across the city, which is really critical. We have a number of aging buildings. We've been working on that for a while and we have to keep working on improving those for our kids. And as Council Member Johnson pointed out, uh, we do have a funding gap between the McCleary solution and what we're able to raise locally. So our ep &O levy this year is absolutely critical. And as Council Member Herbold pointed out, um, we are asking for additional authority, um, knowing that we would have to, in fact, have legislative action to collect on that. Seattle is not unique in this. Several districts are taking this tack because we don't want to have to come back to voters and ask again and spend more resources and time on that. So thank you for your support for our 53,000 kids and appreciate all the work that you're doing. Um, I would also like to remark that this does go hand in hand with the FEP levy. We need both pieces to make this work in our city. So thank you for that as well. And I want to apologize on behalf of Greg Wong because he had to leave, but that was the point that he wanted to make. So okay. thank you. Thank you. Jake Ewart. Hi, my name is Jake Ewart. Uh, I'm a volunteer with Schools First that you just heard about. I'm also a parent of kids in the Seattle Public Schools. I've got a second grader, a kindergartner, and a little guy will be in kindergarten soon. Uh, these levies are really important to me. They're very, very important to the city. The capital levy is obviously important uh, to uh, improve and replace some schools. Uh, and the operations levy, obviously important to bridge the gap between all the improvements in funding the state has made public schools need for services now. You know, a lot of folks uh, have been moving to this town and will continue moving here, interested in putting their kids in Seattle public schools. It's really important that we continue investing in them. Uh, I know one thing about the money that's going to be collected. Every single dollar is going to be used to support our kids. So it's a great investment. I urge you to vote yes. Thanks very much. 
Thank you. And thanks for letting us know Greg uh, was not here, but we did have him, his, he, he, Greg on the sign-up sheet. And Greg, thank you for all the work you're doing. Okay, seeing no further speakers signed up to speak either in favor or opposition to the resolution, uh, the public comment period for this time will be closed. The council will now proceed with a vote on the resolution 31860. Okay. Those in favor of adopting a resolution 31860, please vote aye. 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 Those opposed vote no. The motion carries. The resolution is adopted. Then chair will sign it. Thank you very much. With pleasure. Is there any further business coming for the council? Why don't we commence at 3 o'clock for the Select Committee on MHA? So you've got about uh, 12 minutes. Great. Right. Thank 12 you. Minutes and we'll be back on the dais. Councilor Mosqueda. Mr. President, I'd like to ask to be excused next Tuesday. Um, I'm going to be traveling to Washington, D.C. to serve on the National Task Force for Addressing Homelessness and Housing with the National League of Cities and honored to be there on behalf of 18 other cities. If I may be excused, I'll promise to bring everything back that I learned. <laughs> okay. Um, you said Tuesday, January 22nd. Once you've got it. Councilmember Mosqueda has moved and was seconded to be excused from on January 22nd. Any comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. She's excused from 122. Any further comments? If not, we stand adjourned and see you in a few minutes. Thank you very much.